Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Tonight, we have two questions regarding the ninth commandment that we're going to go through. And these help us to define truth and the standard that God has given us. If you would now take a look at the screen, and we will go through question 61 and question 62. Question 61, which is the ninth commandment? The ninth commandment is, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. In question 62, what is required in the ninth commandment? The ninth commandment requires the maintaining and promoting of truth between man and man and of our own and our neighbor's good name, especially in witness bearing. We live in a culture of change that silences and encourages outrage at any disagreement. We as Christians are slowly seeing a shift and we are actually becoming the minority of this nation as well. And as a nation, we're becoming more secular, meaning that we are moving away from the objective and unchangeable standards um, that this nation was founded upon, one nation under God. And we are moving to becoming a nation with no standards whatsoever. To secularize also means to become relative, to remove the unchangeable so that everyone can believe whatever they want to, whether it's true, whether it's false, it doesn't matter. This worldview makes us God, makes us feel like we are God, that we get to determine what is right and what is wrong. This has been an issue since the beginning. This is nothing new to our nation. But we as humans naturally like to think that we get to live like we are God. And so what happens, though, is that society does whatever seems right to them. And in the process, we lose sight of truth. We lose our sense of shame. And we, we think we've re removed absolute truth from the picture altogether. All we've really done is made absolutes the weapon in which we beat each other down with. Ravi, Sa Ravi Zacharias says this on the subject. Everyone believes in absolutes. The question is not if you believe in absolutes. The question is if you live by them yourself or you use them to judge everyone else. We're certain that absolutes exist. It's undeniable. But the challenge that you and I face as Christians is how do we know what is true? How do we define absolutes appropriately and see them as they truly are? Pastor Ryan talked about this the past few weeks. We know that we're capable of being deceived. And so how do we make certain that we, as Christians, are not being deceived? When we think about a standard, I think one of the best arguments uh, to be on the subject of moral law and the necessity for a moral law giver who creates the standard of right and wrong. So we understand that right and wrong exist. It's undeniable. And so if that is true, therefore there must be a moral law giver, someone who is above this standard that we live by. And God must be that standard. He is the one that defines what is true and what is good and what is wrong. God determines truth. And it's by his word that we know and we understand the standard. If you would please turn to Psalm chapter 86, verse 10. This is our text this evening. Psalm 86, verses 10 through 13. And we will look at this text and divide this truth from there. We're also reminded in John chapter 1 that the word is defined by the Son of God. John 1.14, the word became flesh. He dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. This is who God is, and it's in Christ that we define what is good and what is true. If you would please stand for the reading of Psalm chapter 86, verses 10 through 13. A Psalm of David. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. 
I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You've delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we consider this text. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, for your goodness. Lord, thank you so much that you've created this standard. Lord, that we have laws and that you define them. Lord, I pray that you would teach us your way tonight, that we would study your word, that we would desire to walk in your truth and that you would unite us to yourself through your son, Lord, and remind us of the steadfast love that you have for us as your people. Bless this time, Lord, and be glorified through your law. Amen. You may be seated. So I want to point out a few truths that we see in this text that help us in pursuing truth and help us in loving Christ. Verses 10 and 13 remind us of God's faithfulness to his people, his steadfast love, a.k.a. his covenant-keeping love for those that he's redeemed from spiritual death, from the depths of Sheol, as this text says. He, as creator, is above creation. Verse 10 makes that distinction. You alone are God. This gives him the sole responsibility of determining what is good and what is not. God's ways are not our ways. And that's why it's so important that David requests in verse 11 that God would teach him his ways, his holy and high ways, his, his standard of what is true. Honestly, a superior way. David requests to walk in the truth of the Lord. We're reminded of what Proverbs 1 teaches us and we see as a theme throughout the Old Testament and that would be the fear of the Lord and that it's the beginning of wisdom because that's a holy fear of the almighty creator. To dwell with God was a huge deal in the Old Covenant. God's holiness was consuming. He is a consuming fire. God does not put up with sin in any regard. God is holy. We forget this. We forget this over and over and over. But God has very high standards. And so in the Old Testament, a holy fear of the Lord was appropriate. You would not draw near to God without properly cleansing yourself. And it's so interesting how David requests to be united to the Lord so that he would fear his name, to mean that he has a proper understanding, true knowledge of who God is, that he would accurately fear this God, Yahweh, God Almighty, creator and sustainer of all things. We forget how almighty and all-powerful and all-knowing our God truly is. Now, God or I'm sorry, now David doesn't receive so much fear that he cannot draw near to God, but this fear actually unites David to the Lord and it draws him nearer. It's a relationship of honor, realizing our own desperation and need, our shortcoming to the holiness of God. This deficit, this deep, deep, deep deficit that we cannot pay back to the Lord. It reminds us of this wretched state and the all steadfast love of our Heavenly Father, the redeeming grace that He shows us as His people. Friends, this commandment is important because we are not truth keepers, especially when it's convenient. We lie. We speak poorly of our neighbor. We lack the integrity of God. Friends, this reminds us that we cannot perfectly keep the law. This reveals our greatest need, the need that is fulfilled in Christ. When we repent of our sin and trust in Christ, we no longer are under condemnation. We are united 
with the Lord. And so our pursuit of truth must be rooted in seeking the truth giver and his word. Our pursuit for truth must be for his own glory, not our own, having nothing to do with our own glory. And once we are rooted in scripture and seeking to please the Lord, it is out of humility and integrity that we pursue truth in all things. It's from this point that we are able to glorify the Lord in truth, and especially in witness bearing as our answer states. We're called to have integrity. We're called to bear truth. And I would challenge you this evening to continue to fight for truth in such a difficult time. As God's people were commanded to do so, we're commanded to share the gospel with people. This is the greatest truth we could share. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. Repent of your sin. Turn to the Lord and, and receive refreshment. This is the only truth that we have, that people are dead in their sin, according to Ephesians 2, but God, being rich in mercy, makes us alive. What does Romans 10 remind us? How will people know if they've not heard the truth of God's word? How are they to hear without the preaching and teaching of his word? We are to stand for truth in the marketplace of thoughts. We have nothing else to offer but the truth of God's word. We have nothing to offer but the grace of God, which is sufficient for you and for I and for anyone who repents of their sin and turns to Christ. Let me share with you one of the, one of the most encouraging uh, texts to me this week uh, regarding Christ praying on our behalf in John 17. John 17, 17, Jesus is speaking to the Father before he's crucified for us, and he says this. He says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. What does that say about the value of God's word in our lives? What does that say about the, the love that Christ has for his people asking this before he went and died a gruesome death. He bore the wrath of God for you. And this was his prayer beforehand, that God would sanctify his people by his word. And so this command tonight to love truth, to not lie, reminds us to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength because Jesus is the way the truth and the life and we are commanded to abide in him let me share with you again the two questions this evening which is the ninth commandment the ninth commandment is thou shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor and question 62 what is required in the ninth commandment the ninth commandment requires the maintaining and promoting of truth between man and man and of our own in our neighbor's good name, especially in witness bearing. Let's go again to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise you for your goodness towards us. We praise you for being almighty, holy, perfect, and yet being so gracious that you would have steadfast love towards us, Lord. What a blessing. May we not forget how good you are to your people. Lord, how good you are as our God and King. Lord, may we obey your commands. May we seek to obey your commands that you would be glorified, Lord, that we would love you more with more of our being and that you would be pleased, Lord, and that you would sanctify us by your word. Thank you for this evening, Lord. Thank you for this gathering. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. Thank you once again. Another great teaching on a Wednesday night. It's good to have you all out, those of you out in internet land. We're glad you're here. Can you imagine if God could not be depended on? Could you imagine if God did not tell us the truth one time? But uh, God is not like that. As Vogie said, he never changes. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. When God, God, when, when God moves, when God does something, there's never a shadow cast. He's pure in all his ways. He tells the truth. Always. It never changes. Imagine, Jake, if you found out I lied to you, that I just t didn't tell you the truth. Well, why on earth would you ever want to trust the pastor ever again? Or what if you lied to your mom and dad? Why would they trust you with great things, with important matters? It's another thing. Another reason why gossip is so absolutely horrible. We can't gossip in this church. We dare not gossip to one another. Um, and you can do it. It starts out when you're kids, you know. You want to tell on Henry. Henry did something to you, whatever. And uh, you tell your mom part of the truth. Not all the truth, just part of the truth, you know. This is what we do. We tell half-truths. This is what Satan uh, tempts us to do. Truth. Truth. We should just love truth. And um, there's a reason why your parents teach you to tell the truth. Harmony, we always tell the truth. We were, Mom and Daddy never lied to you. They never want to lie to you. And you never want to lie to them. You always want to tell the truth. It hurts our hearts when we don't tell the truth. Doesn't it hurt your heart, William, when you say a fib to your dad and then you know that you didn't tell the truth? You feel really bad because now why should dad ever trust you with anything? You told him a lie. It's hard to rebuild after that. It's hard. When you break trust like that, you break trust with another person like that, man, it takes a long time to rebuild, doesn't it? We love truth. There are good reasons why God the Father, who never lies, in that nature of who God is, he is the very standard of right and wrong. He is right and wrong. It's not like he has to adjust to the rules that he made. He is the rule. He never lies. He is great and does wondrous things. So when you look at greatness, there is nothing that is greater. There's no greatness that could ever match the greatness of God. And the, one of the greatness, the great things of God is that he never lies. And he can be trusted. There's no one as trustworthy as God. You can trust him. He won't lead you astray. He's the good shepherd. He leads us in paths of righteousness, truth, goodness. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you so much, Vogie. Key stuff. Isn't this critical stuff that we're learning? You know, the moral law that God has given us, the Ten Commandments, it's a beautiful truth, beautiful truth in a world saturated with lies and fake news. And man, you don't know what to believe. There's more information than we ever thought possible. You should spend, for every minute you spend on the internet, you should spend three minutes in the word of God. Maybe make that commitment. 
Let's tell the truth to one another. Let's live by the truth with one another. And I want to thank uh, Ray on a side note tonight. I saw you doing your fancy stuff there tonight. I, I saw what you did. You, you've, you've made two screens. So every once in a while you skip to one and then go to another like a, like a big shot professional. So that's awesome. Thank you for all that you do to make our ministry possible at such a time as this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Vogie. God, thank you for blessing this church with him and these wonderful uh, teachings we, uh, we've had here this evening. I pray that you will give us all a commitment to truth and to telling the truth with one another and loving the truth and running from gossip running from division and hatred and these sorts of things. Let us tell truth to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Ryan, do you think we could sing a song together? You want to grab the guitar? The key of D, I think, is the cry of my heart. Did you do it in D or whatever key you want to do? Do it, yeah, do it in D, it'd be easier to sing. Do you remember the song? It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. That's what I thought it was, but I, all of a sudden I had it. To be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. And then maybe we'll just do the first verse because I'm afraid we'll forget the second one. Teach me your holy ways, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Teach me your Holy ways, O Lord, and make me wholly devoted to you. Let's see if we can do it. We'll do it twice over because we'll probably do terrible uh, the first time. Okay, but. And it's good for us to learn to sing like this without having to stare at a, a page, right? It is a cry of my heart to follow you. It is a cry of my heart to be close to you. It is a cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Let's do it again. It is a cry of my heart to follow you. It is a cry of my heart to be close to you. It is a cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Teach me, teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, so I can walk in your truth. Teach me your holy ways. Teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, and make me wholly devoted to you. It is a cry of my heart to follow you. It is a cry of my heart to be close to you. It is a cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. It is a cry of my heart to follow you. It is a cry of my heart to be close to you. It is a cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. All of the days of my life. One more time. All of the days of my life. All right. Go in his peace. Go in his truth. God bless you. We'll see you. Were you thinking of it?